This is Kat Sturtz from rockingyourpath.com with another episode of Fast Action Fridays. Today, my special guest is Diane Wingert. I hope I said that right. You sure did. She's, she's a psychotherapist with over 20 years experience. And today we're going to talk about a topic that I know about but have very little experience in. And that is ADHD and how that can affect entrepreneurs. So glad to have you here, Diane. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Thank you for inviting me and I'm thrilled to be here. As a matter of fact, I actually pivoted away from being a psychotherapist and became a coach. Uh, there are many reasons for this, but most importantly is that I was diagnosed with ADHD just a mm -hmm. few years ago. And the fact that I am a woman and an adult makes that very unlikely. But the fact is I've had ADHD my whole life and I didn't even know it. As I began to learn more about it, Kat, what I discovered is a very significant percentage of entrepreneurs, it, depending on whose study you quote, somewhere between 60 and 75% of entrepreneurs have ADHD traits, even if they fall short of the full spectrum for a diagnosis. So it's something I'm quite fascinated by, left psychotherapy behind, and now I work exclusively with entrepreneurs who struggle with ADHD challenges that interfere with their success. All right, that leads to the obvious question. Tell us exactly what ADHD is. Absolutely. The legal definition, if you talk about the psychiatric manual, is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. However, the main reason why most women don't get identified either as girls or as adult women is because we present differently. Everybody thinks of ADHD as those hyperactive little boys that can't sit still, are always disrupting the classroom, don't listen to directions, and are bouncing off the walls. And while that's true for some, there are also many girls who were quietly underachieving and because they didn't disrupt the class, nobody even knew. And that continues on to this day, unfortunately. So if you are an entrepreneur and someone, perhaps someone you work with has said, are you sure you're not ADHD or ADD? Because the terms are used interchangeably what you would be looking for are high energy, creativity, usually high intelligence, risk taking, a dislike for boredom, the mundane, a strong dislike for the status quo, very innovative, and oftentimes impatient, fast thinking, fast moving, fast acting. I would guess almost every serial entrepreneur has ADHD, whether they know it or not. And you will tend to find them in environments that are fast paced, ever changing, um, disruption. There's a lot of folks in the tech field. A lot of folks with ADHD have very outgoing personalities, are very charismatic. And while they may make a lot of mistakes, they can charm you away from even noticing them. So I think probably a few people are already popping to mind. And I had the traits of an entrepreneur even in childhood, only there really wasn't anyone in my life at that time who noticed them or encouraged them. As a matter of fact, when you're a kid and you have a low threshold for boredom and you don't really like sitting around listening to things that go on longer than you need them to, you're generally considered a problem. And I think it's one of the reasons why so many of us end up in entrepreneurship. Either we just don't conform to the norm very well, so we get a lot of negative feedback, as in low grades in school or getting fired in the workplace, or we just realize that there's no job or workplace that can contain our creativity, our energy, and our desire to keep trying new things, so we venture out on our own. I think that list is really interesting because I fit a lot of that dynamic, but I don't fit some very specific things. Like I don't like boredom, but I don't mind. I find something else to do, but I don't rush to do it. And I can be mm. very, very patient. Uh, a lot of people think I'm high energy, but my high energy comes and goes. <laughs> I, I choose my times. I'm an introvert at heart but I choose to be an ambivert, which I'm sure you know. I choose sure. my, my times when I 
want to step out and uh, be seen. Um, but I can identify with a lot of what you're saying about not being diagnosed um, for a lot of people, especially for, for females, because Absolutely. we can be seen as bitchy or bossy or all kinds of other traits and not looking at maybe the underlying things that are the same as our uh, male counterparts are experiencing and, and being identified with. Absolutely true, Kat, and I think it's one of the really uh, important and, and um, significant aspects about ADHD in females, and also just entrepreneurial females, is that the very traits that are often applauded in men <clears throat> are considered negatives in women. Mm -hmm. That's why when I see a woman wearing a t-shirt that says, I'm not bossy, I'm the boss. I always go for a greeter because you're right. There are definite gender distinctions and we are conditioned according to our gender as to what appropriate behavior is. So mm -hmm. if you have so many good ideas, you keep shooting your hand up in the air in a, in a brainstorming session, you're kind of seen as, you know, sort of overtaking the meeting when in fact your mind moves so much faster than everyone else's, you might be creating 10 ideas to, mm -hmm. to their one. And I think an important distinction about ADHD, and this is not necessarily so that anybody wants to rush out and get diagnosed, because I think the only value in knowing that you may be ADHD is how to leverage the strengths and manage the struggles. And I mention the struggles because if you have the traits, but they don't cause you any problems, you don't have a diagnosis. So the flip side of ADHD, because I've talked about a lot of the the personality traits is time blindness, meaning we never really know what time it is, so we're often late. And we don't know how long things will take, so we grossly over or underestimate. Distractibility to a very high degree. Um, trouble with boundaries. Trouble with hyper-focus. So everyone says attention deficit is kind of a misnomer. We can't pay attention unless something's interesting, but once it's interesting, we can pay attention, as I say, like a beaver building a dam, and nothing can pull us away. This is called hyperfocus. It can cause us to miss appointments. It can cause us to forget that the rest of the world exists, forget obligations we have to other people, and has led to more than one business partnership breaking up and even divorce. Because when you're so focused on pursuing your goals that you forget that you have commitments to others, obviously that's going to cause trouble. So I say the triple threat that you'll often see, especially with female entrepreneurs, is procrastination, perfectionism, and people pleasing. And if mm -hmm. you happen to have all of those traits, there's no question that they interfere with your ability to reach your goals and to be as successful as you deserve to be. Oh, yeah, I can understand that completely. And I'm sure our listeners can to now make sure if you're watching this to look in the blog post below or in the youtube description below we're going to have a link to a freebie uh, download from diane that talks about six steps to what ADHD, adhd mastery mastery and i think even if you like you mentioned undiagnosed with this or just have some of these i'm assuming that these steps have value. So what are some of the steps or tips that you have for turning these struggles into strengths and capitalizing on the strengths we, we do recognize? Absolutely. Well, I think everybody who has ADHD, and frankly, most entrepreneurs who don't have ADHD as well, struggle with getting everything done on their to-do list. It, <laughs> it's probably just a universal problem these days. So like, Hand raised. So a lot of folks, in fact, I would say most clients of productivity coaches have unidentified ADHD because we often struggle with productivity. And when you have big dreams, big plans, big goals, that you're constantly falling short of them, it can be very discouraging, especially when you see less talented people constantly passing you by because you're still working on your next big idea. So I would say some of the strategies that I teach people that are really, really helpful is number one, understanding that um, time management 
is really not the most important thing because we can't really manage time. Time just is. Everybody has the same number of hours in the day, days in the week, and so forth. What I think is much more helpful, especially for those of us who procrastinate, get distracted, are impulsive, and time blind, is to practice energy management and obligation management. What do I mean by that? Energy management is every one of us has different times of day that we are more energetic, different times of day we are more creative, different times of day we are more focused, and this is irregardless of whether you have ADHD or not. Mm -hmm. Some people are morning people. They get up, their brain is fully charged, and they can just start immediately attacking their goals, but as the day goes by, their battery drains, 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 and by 5, 6, 7 p.m., they're basically useless. That's me. Other people <laughs> are slow to start. I'm not even allowed to speak to my husband for the first two hours because I will wake up. I got my brain game on instantly and I'll turn to him and say, Hey, you know what I was just thinking? He's like, stop (laughs) others. And I'd say they're more of the majority cap. Um, They're more slow to wake up. So it's like they don't wake up with a fully charged brain. It's maybe half charged. So there's certain things they need to do and certain amount of time that needs to pass. So If you, let's say you work in an industry, your business caters to people that you need to connect with from eight to five, but your brain game doesn't really get all the way on until 1 p.m., then you need to do some things to speed up the process or you're going to miss half the day, right? So some of the things that we know for a fact work really well is cardio exercise, 30 minutes, It can be a brisk walk around your neighborhood with the dog. You don't have to, you know, and especially this is a COVID situation we're in right now. So the gyms are closed anyway, but any kind of cardio exercise that you actually enjoy, you can dance in your living room. It doesn't have to be anything official like running or biking or taking a Zumba class. 30 minutes of cardio exercise will absolutely ramp up your brain. Caffeine. I don't have to tell you how well that works. <laughs> Why? It's a stimulant. It's in the same family as the drugs they use to treat ADHD for those who choose to have them. So knowing what time of day is optimal for you. A lot of people say, well, I just kind of have to wait for my creativity to kick in or for my energy to kick in or my motivation to kick in. This is not true. I, I teach that you can craft your day by changing your environment. So for mm-hmm. example, your brain needs light to signal that it's time to be awake. So open the windows, open the blinds, open the shutters early instead of going around with your eyes half closed, struggling to get to the kitchen and make coffee without opening them. <laughs> like these are, these are long-term habits that do take time to change. But One of the things I've noticed with a lot of my clients is they say, well, half the day is wasted by the time I'm fully ready to go, but then they're resistant to making the changes that are necessary. Yeah, I challenge that one because I'm a lifelong night owl, but Mm -hmm. I can do mornings when I have to or I want to. I mean, I was a, for 25 years, I was a dairy dairy farmer. You That's know, like a 4 a.m. Farmer. start, right? I got right? up and milked cows and fed, <laughs> fed chickens and uh, fed calves and did all of that. I also was an ESL tutor and my students were in South Korea, which meant my shift online began at four o'clock in the morning. And I could do that. But I also had worked into my day a little nap. And then my books, a lot of my creativity was done in the middle of the night when there weren't other distractions. Yeah. And I still do that. I can't do the all nighters I used to. No, <laughs> no. Not consecutively There's... like I used to. <clears throat> That's but... how I got through four years of college at UCLA was those all nighters. <laughs> no way I could do that now. But I love that you say we can manage this. I, and, I, and I totally agree with you that a lot of times people use things as an excuse to not face what their fears are and look for the solutions to get by what's really the problem here. Yes, this is, this is the action that you're doing, but what is the motivation or the fear behind not wanting to change that? It's such a good point, Kat. And, and I'll tell you, I'll be the first one to say that I put off 
going to the doctor and just finding out for sure. I, I, all three of my kids from two marriages have ADD. I'm the common denominator <laughs> and neither of their dads had ADD. So it's very clear that it came from me. But I also had this belief that um, even though I was a therapist and I'm being like a little bit of a hypocrite here, I was so good at diagnosing and treating ADHD in adults because to me it was perfectly obvious. And yet with myself, it was like, yeah, sort of, but, and I think it's important to note a couple of things. Um, one is that like most things, it's on a spectrum. And I'm going to guess that in your audience, there's any number of people who say, I have some of those traits and there are times that I wonder, am I or aren't I? But I don't have enough of them for it to be obvious. Or even if I do have enough, I don't want to embrace any kind of a stigmatizing label. And I'm sorry to say that here we are in 2020 and mental health conditions are still stigmatized. I don't think we've made a lot of progress. Now, uh, I don't think anybody needs to be di diagnosed if they don't want to be. But what I do think they need in the first step of the, five, of the six stages of ADHD mastery is self-awareness. Mm. I think we owe it to ourselves to know who we are and how we are. You mentioned something a moment ago about how you could get up really early to milk the cows or how you could stay up very late for your ESL training. And what you were uh, unwittingly leading into is one of the other strategies that I teach. And that is what I call the four ADHD drivers. What I mean by this cat is what are the things that drive us to take action instead of sitting on the couch, you know, binge watching Netflix or thumbing through our Instagram feed? What actually gets us to get up and go when there are thousands of other options just at the click of a mouse button without any effort whatsoever? Well, for someone with ADHD or let's just say ADHD traits, there are four drivers. And I put them in a certain order because the top one is when we are functioning at our very, very best, it is because we are firmly engaged with this driver. And that is interest. Mm, you absolutely. were interested in having a successful farm. You were interested in teaching these students English because you were interested. You were highly motivated mm -hmm. and you just frankly did what it took. Now, I'm sure you didn't really relish the 345 alarm. <laughs> but you did it anyway, because as soon as you were doing that interesting thing, it was totally worth it. So interest is the number one driver. And as much time as we can spend doing the things that really, really interest us, you can also think of it as engagement or satisfying our curiosity, our fascination, anything that we're drawn toward will motivate us to be at our best, our most focused, our most energized, and our most productive. The second one is challenge. Sometimes the challenge comes in the form of a parent or a colleague or even a spouse saying, you'll never succeed in online business. And we say to ourselves- <laughs> Don't and challenge some, me because I'm gonna prove you wrong. <laughs> I'm gonna say, just watch me. Or silently we say to ourselves, oh yeah? So being challenged or be a sense of competition, like maybe there's someone else you really admire and you just want to catch up to them mm -hmm. and then you want to surpass them and then you want to keep on going. That's a wonderful driver for someone with ADHD and many people who don't have it. The third is novelty. And this is what we call the shiny object syndrome. Mm -hmm. Shiny objects are anything that's just like, ooh. When I run into people I haven't seen for a while, Kat, I never say, how are you? I say, what's new? Because that's really what I care about the most. New, novel, shiny, sparkly, different. That will grab me. Unfortunately, a lot of us default to driver number four. And if we do not manage our ADHD well, number four is the only one that gets us to act. And that's urgency. Urgency is the squeaky wheel. It's the client that's literally blowing up your inbox. It is the nagging, you know, spouse. It's the dog that keeps whining, whatever it is. And the bills that are going to be late any minute. Oh, I knew you were going to bring that one up. I've always told people <laughs> nothing motivates a writer like a do bill. That's the truth. 
deadline. And this is the other thing, you know, a lot of people with ADHD do extremely well and are incredibly successful. And if we had more time, I could list off dozens and dozens of highly successful entrepreneurs with ADHD. Mm -hmm. However, they almost always have accountability and the ability to outsource the things they're not good at. If anybody is interested in knowing a little bit more about these four drivers and thinking, hmm, I wonder how I could, my very first episode of my new podcast, which was just launched a couple of months ago, The Driven Woman, I called the four drivers in that episode, one, fancy, gritty, shiny FOMO. And that's just a little bit more fun way of saying the four drivers. But when you know what gets you going, you can use that not against yourself, but to help yourself. Uh, this has been so interesting. And we will make sure that there's a link to the podcast too in the show notes for everybody. I really want to thank you for being here today and bringing attention to the ADHD, the ADD conversation. On um, For those of us who may have some of those traits, all of those traits who have been diagnosed or not diagnosed, because I see value in what you have shared, whether we are or are not. <laughs> Thank people, you. I, I know the people who watch this and who listen to this, and we are creatives. And part of our, our part of that is we are often idea hoarders. We get so oh. many ideas that we lose the focus on staying with the one long enough to complete it. I know that's true with a lot of my private clients is helping so them true. keep that interest and that urgency and everything to get all the way through a project from beginning to end without losing track of all these other wonderful ideas that are a constant stream in our heads. Absolutely true. Starting right. is easy. Finishing is hard. <laughs> Absolutely. So the fast action uh, tip if I'm understanding correctly, is being willing to acknowledge and look for solutions to these things that might be, we may be struggling with. And I love that because I'm all about finding solutions. To me, solutions are the only thing that moves us forward, is wanting to know what they are and putting them into action. And seeing it as an adventure mm -hmm. instead of a burden. Excellent. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, Diane, for being here. If you're watching this, make sure and watch, uh, look in the show notes for all the links. And this is Kat Sturtz closing another episode of Fast Action Fridays. Remember to join me next week when I'll have another great guest. In the meantime, remember to keep rocking your unique path to success. Bye.